couple of years ago, I attended a two-day active shooter awareness training. I learned a lot in that training. Even though I've been to these sorts of trainings before, I learned that only 4% of the time do active shooters choose houses of worship as the place where they're going to carry out their violence. That fact in and of itself should offer some sense of safety, right? <clears throat> I was reminded that all of us should consider where the exits are anytime we enter any building, mall, movie theater, concert hall, or even a crowded outdoor space. At the active shooter training, I heard again the fight, hide, or run advice. If you're going to fight, fight like your life depends on it. If you're going to hide, there's a difference between being concealed, like ducking down under the chair, and seeking and finding cover. In other words, get out of the room, get behind a brick wall, etc. Then there is what most of us would choose, run. Run with your hands up and nothing in your hands, not your purse, not your coat, not anything, nothing in your hand. The training offered several ways to recognize and possibly intervene to prevent those individuals who may be in the process becoming the person who the police called an active murderer. This information about what to look for, how to notice the signs of a person who would do such a thing, was important, but primarily applies to places of employment or schools, the kind of places where you could possibly be aware of the indicators of a possible progression down a path that leads to a mass shooting, an intentional mass shooting. It was also clear that those known to us, members, friends, or their family members aren't likely to be those who would feel compelled to do such a thing here. The police and the other officials at the awareness training suggested it would be more likely a person who has become motivated by an ideology of hate who would enter a house of worship. Yet where that has happened, where an ideology of hate was the motivation for a shooting in a house of worship, the shooting was done by a person who was a complete stranger to the congregation. Hate does drive active shooters into Jewish congregations or into black churches, but rarely does hate alone drive shooters into a Unitarian Universalist congregation because we don't even show up on the radar of you should hate those people lists. <laughs> so not likely they're going to pick us if it's because of hate. What is way more likely is for us to be targeted by a person who has a grievance against someone here or someone they think is here. The shooter has already progressed to the point where they believe murdering anyone connected with that person that they are aggrieved with will satisfy their sense of having been wronged. The ex-spouse or ex-partner may not be someone we'd know well or be in a position to recognize or to have observed a progression of behavior we would be very unlikely to witness changes in their behavior over time. That's what happened in the Knoxville Unitarian Universalist congregation on July 27, 2008. An unemployed Tennessee truck driver named Jim David Atkinson came in with a gun concealed in a guitar case and opened fire on members of the congregation during a church youth performance that involved the Tennessee Valley UU Church and the Maribel congregation. He killed two people and he wounded six others before he was restrained by church members. He later said he had planned to keep shooting until the police arrived and killed him. A letter or a manifesto was found in his vehicle after the shooting and it attributed his motivation as hatred of liberals, Democrats, African-Americans and homosexuals. In the letter, he also described what he believed to be the cult-like atmosphere of the church. That is what was in the newspapers. Yet, I was serving in Greensboro, actually I was in Greenville, North Carolina at the time, and I heard from my colleagues and friends more toward the Knoxville area that they knew him as an ex-partner of another person who was only an occasional visitor at TVUUC, Tennessee Valley UU Church in Knoxville. Atkinson was familiar to some people in informal UU circles. He felt aggrieved by something personal that had to do with his ex. 
and that morphed into a hate ideology. He later pled guilty to two counts of murder and received a life sentence for, of life in prison without parole. One of the persons who was killed that day stood in front of Atkinson when he raised his gun. No children were physically harmed, thank goodness. He shot and killed another person and there were others injured. And there were extensive, there was extensive immediate trauma that the UU trauma ministry team responded to immediately. I suspect trauma remains in the culture of that church and in the other UU congregation that was part of the event that day, even until now. For years, TV UUC kept their front doors locked shut, even on Sunday mornings. They had grown, they had become used to looking at who was there and had to know who that person was before they would let them in. I don't know if they still do that. I would suspect that that and other security measures are part of their long-term trauma response, even until now. Locking doors and increasing security measures are certainly an expected and reasonable way for them and other traumatized congregations to return to some sense of safety. And that sort of event has not happened again at a UU congregation, to my knowledge, in the nearly 15 years since that time. So how should we stay welcoming and keep those inside this place safe? It's a question that many UU congregations have asked ever since July 2008. It seems to me to be a matter of deciding what level of risk we are willing to take. It was clear from the shooter awareness training that the wider the perimeter of our preventative measures, the better. What that means is that we ought to be doing, or keep those intent on active shooting out of the interior of the building. You do that, for the experts, by hardening your perimeter with well-placed, visible, and operating exterior security cameras. Now, my congregation, which is in Somerville, New Jersey, even though it's called you congregation of Somerset Hills, we're no longer in Somerset Hills. Anyway, the point is that we've been thinking about what to do ever since this training, which was almost two years ago. We still haven't put up any cameras except on the back door, which nobody can see during the service. But anyway, that's what the police wanted us to do. They wanted to us to harden our perimeters. You could include signs that say those cameras are there and are on. You could cover windows so those on the outside can't see where you are. Perhaps you can make sure your exterior doors are locked from the outside and the inside, or at least entry is monitored by those looking, those trained to look for potential threats. How would one know who might be intent on doing violence? Well, there are ways. Back when I was in Greensboro, North Carolina, we took an active shooter training in North Carolina with a bunch of evangelical churches. And in the training, the police said, well, you should arm your, your security guards and your greeters. And the other church leaders said, yes. And we said, no, absolutely not. But they did teach us that you should have greeters that look for people with long trench coats on maybe in the spring or the summer and have a bulge in their pocket. Or, yeah, right. Or you should look for people who are, you don't know, but they come in agitated. Or they're looking around, where are the children? Where, where, where is the preacher stand, et cetera, et cetera. That there should be someone out there or whatever door might be open to see if there are people that are trying to come in that look suspicious. Well, you have to be really well-trained and sensitive and courageous to say, uh, are you having problems today? There, were, there was a man who came into the Greensboro congregation after that training, and some of the greeters didn't know him and asked him, why did he come to church there? You know, he would ask any visitor. He said, well, I'm upset. How upset? <laughs> they kind of asked him, and they walked him to his car and sent him back home. I think they did the right thing, but who knows? Who knows? How would you know who might be intent on doing violence if they're a complete stranger to you? 
Once a person intent on doing harm enters our doors, the very best we can do is fight, hide, or flee. And be prepared for the resulting immediate and long-term trauma this sort of incident will cause. There are things to learn about fight, hide, and flee. I'll not forget what they said to us at the recent active shooter training. Fight as if your life depends on it. Don't just, you know, try to talk love at that moment. Knock them down with a chair, several people. Whatever you can pick up and hit them over the head with, do it. If you're fighting, if you're fleeing, put your hands up with nothing else in your hands because the police don't know the difference between you and the shooter. Everyone will be considered a suspect at first. So put your hands up, get out. During that active shooter training where I learned this information again, a question, actually a statement, came forth during that first day, it was a two-day training, from a leader of another house of worship. He said, if there is a choice between a place that welcomes and a place that turns away, we are choosing to welcome. We must. That is why we exist. I was impressed by that person's statement. And then I wondered, why are you at this active shooter training then? I certainly respect that person's perspective, but I don't think it's an either or choice. I think it is a matter of choosing the level of risk we are comfortable with while still maintaining our identity. It is not as stark as choosing either or, either a fear-based lockdown to all but us kind of approach or choosing a wide open to anyone, anytime, come what may approach. If we were to choose the letter, we might feel that stationing a few trained to know which visitor, which stranger needs intervention is enough. It might be that you could recognize one who is not yet quite at the end of a progression to becoming an active shooter. Maybe that was the case for the fellow they walked back out to his car. It is possible that the person is on their way but not there yet, and we may show enough empathy and compassion that makes a difference in their heart and in their mind. A person who is nursing a grievance, but well before they become an active shooter. But is it right or fair to expect some ushers to be that sensitive to another and bold enough to intervene? Well, maybe, maybe it is, but I think that's a hard conversation and you don't have it with the whole congregation. I've had congregations say to me, we need to have an active shooter training. You need to do it. You need to tell everybody in the congregation what they should do and you need to specially train the ushers. I'm like, okay, I was there when the police came in Greensboro to our congregation. We had the ushers there. You know what they said? They said if the person is at the end of the progression and intent on shooting, there is nothing you can do except stand in front of them. And I said, okay, so you want me to tell the rest of the congregation that ahead of time? And I said, no, I'm not doing that. This is supposed to be a safe place. Train me in how to respond to the people after it happens especially the, tra the immediately tra traumatized. If there are some people in the congregation bold enough to stand in front of a shooter, I'm not pushing them. They may, then they do it. The rest of us need to know how to get out, how to put your hands up without anything in it, in your hands, how to get behind whatever wall a bullet won't go through, if that's what you need to do. We have to accept what we can't control. It's just naive to expect total safety and security in this day and time, any place. You have to consider what you're willing to risk to live your values, which may be multiple and in some ways conflicting values. How much isolation did you choose during the pandemic, for example? Complete isolation? Was it worth it? Did you close yourself off from most other human beings? Did you have a circle of people you hung with? 
whatever decision you made, you made the right one. I'm not saying you didn't, but I'm saying we'll all make different decisions about what is right for us and our family and our congregation. If we lock the doors on Sunday mornings, are we the welcoming and bold faith we seek to be? Is there someone, if your doors are locked, I don't know if they are or not, it's not really the point. The point is, if they are locked, is someone close by, if somebody comes in late, to hear them? If they're not locked, is there somebody paying attention? Now, the police said, you know, it's usually the minister who's paying attention because the minister's looking at the door, not the congregation. The congregation's looking at the minister. So you need to find a special song to sing if somebody disturbing comes in. I said, okay. So I taught my congregation at the time, if we start singing a Jesus song, that means we're in trouble. <laughs> That's what exactly what they did. They laughed, but they said they wouldn't forget that. So <laughs> we have to choose a love-based response. Of course, that's not simple. Love for who? Love for us? Love for our families? Love for the minister? Love for the person outside the door? All at once? That's a complicated response to that question. How do you choose a love-based response? There are always, no matter what you choose, is the risk of loss of life. And of course, we have to accept that. We still go to the movies, right? We still send our kids to school, right? That active shooter training in Greensboro that I convinced one other hiring it to go to with me, because we didn't want to be among the very right-wing evangelicals, was all about how to arm and train your ushers to shoot. And both of us left that training going, we would never, ever, ever choose that. Never. We might hire a police person to stand at the door with who's armed. We might do that, but only if the congregation decides that is the right thing to do. It was kind of disheartening that they didn't give us more choices than that. But perhaps it was the audience they thought they were going to be speaking to. I'm going to read something to you that I think helps us understand what we need to do. It's called Moving Forward by sitting and staying, and it was written by UU Minister Elizabeth Stevens. Are you sitting down? These are not words I wanted to hear at the end of a day spent sheltering in place due, a, due to an active shooter situation in my small town, the second in 10 years. But I sat down, took a deep breath, began my journey alongside the friends and family of one of the victims alongside a congregation and a community that ex had experienced a terrifying, confusing, inexplicable loss. I also began a journey through my own trauma and grief. Six adults sitting in a circle in comfort and listening to a seventh person who appeared distressed. Traumatic experiences by definition make us feel overwhelmed, out of control, disconnected, uncomprehending. Pain and grief are not pleasant feelings either. I'm often, often tempted to travel as fast as I can through these uncomfortable places, but trauma defies my attempts to rush. In the weeks and months following the shooting, I stayed in the midst of the pain by letting go of my need for control and tolerating the feelings of powerlessness. Healing wasn't an intellectual process, process but an embodied unfolding. I gave myself the space to be baffled and brokenhearted, to lament. I held space for other confused and grieving people, bearing witness to one another in love and celebrating the miraculous ways that together we discovered a deeper resilience and a greater wisdom. The paradox is this. 
The only way I've been able to move through trauma, my own or those of the one I, ones I love, is to sit and stay. When I create a space for what is real, however incomprehensible and heartbreaking and unbearably painful, my spirit heals. When I do this in community, I discover a deeper wisdom, wisdom and a greater resilience. Somehow, the things that are too much to bear alone are bearable together. Five years later, I got another, are you sitting down, call. This one came when I was a continent away, supporting my mother after my stepfather's death. Do you need me to come home, I asked. No, said the voice on the other end of the line, a member of our lay pastoral ministry team. You taught us how to do this. We'll sit and stay and hold the space until you get back. That's what we need to learn how to do. Horrible things happen all the time, way too much of the time. I'm sure many of you have been affected by some kind of trauma. Perhaps it was a shooting, perhaps it was some other kind of violence. Perhaps it was in a, a space with other people. Perhaps it was just in your home or someone else's home. You have to learn how to sit and stay and hold the space. I am so thankful that the UU Trauma Ministry knows how to do that. I'm so thankful that more often than not, that is the UU congregation's response. To not only learn what to do in the moment, but to learn to have practice what to do afterwards. And they take the risk to be welcoming, but not with the eyes closed, with eyes open. I'll tell you one more story. When I was in the Greenville congregation, we had a man who would come to church almost every Sunday. He would often come early. And when he came early, there was two or three of us in the sanctuary, most times when he came early, and he would start talking to me about what his night before had been like. Now, this guy was very country, lived out in the country, and this is in eastern North Carolina, and he often found some kind of bar out in the country to go to on Saturday nights, um, and he would come in the next morning and tell me how he had to leave that bar because they weren't accepting of him as a gay man, and I'm could imagine how he acted in the bar. And he would come the next morning and tell this long story, and I would try to quiet him down or listen to his story before everybody else got there. And usually the other volunteers that were there with me would just go in the kitchen and shut the door, go in the back of the congregation, I mean, the building, and shut themselves in until I got him settled down. Well, one day he started this again, what all had happened to him at the bar, and he, he seemed very agitated and didn't stop. And right before the service began, I forgot the mics were on, and I was in the pulpit, and I said to him, we don't do that here. And he said, what? And I said, we don't go on and on about how other people in the world are evil and made your night terrible, and then bring that energy into this congregation. He said, oh, okay. He ran out the front door. So I went after him. I said, I'm sorry. You can stay. Just you Tone it down. He said, no, 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 you're right, preacher. I'm off my medications. I'll call you when I get back on. And he did. And, of course, I used that story as a way to train leaders about how it is okay to call people that are in some kind of situation where they're agitated and they're disturbing other people around them to call them to better behavior. Now, he wasn't progressed far enough to have a gun on him, of course, but he disturbed people, and we wanted him to be there, but we also didn't want him to turn the whole thing into a circus about his Saturday night. So we learned how to say, hey, not here. We don't do that here. So let me apologize and say that I hope that I have not made you all feel unsafe and that you will never come in this building again. 
but that you will come in this building and that you will love each other and at least learn to call each other back to, hey, what's going on with you? What's the grievance you're holding? Tell me about it. And then stop at 10 o'clock, please. <laughs> that sort of thing. This is a faith about taking risks, taking risks to love boldly as best we can, as much as we can. Let us sing together hymn 368. Now let us sing. Yeah.